What is up, people? Welcome back and buckle up because things are about to get real. I'm ready if you are. And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. Okay, so this lesson is all about how money gets created. And I'm going to warn you that it's not just that the government prints money. The real story is more complicated than that. To begin with, we need to learn a little bit about how banks work. And here we go. Just to give you fair warning, this is one of the most challenging lessons in this class, but I know you can do this. We'll get through it together, so stick with me. I got you. Let's start with the big picture. What's the purpose of banks? Well, banks are businesses, so they're motivated by the desire to make profit, and the primary way that banks earn profits is by making loans and charging interest to borrowers. Okay, where do banks get money so that they can make loans so that they can profit? Well, this money comes primarily from depositors, people like you and me who open an account with a bank and deposit our money there, as well as from shareholders who own equity in the bank. After we deposit our money in the bank, our deposits are lent out to borrowers. Okay, so a role of a commercial bank is to bring together savers and borrowers. A well-functioning financial system helps achieve economic growth by encouraging greater saving and investment spending. In the U.S., we have a fractional reserve banking system, which means that banks must keep a percentage of deposits as reserves, and they loan out the rest of the money. Okay, so for another definition, bank reserves refer to the money the bank hasn't lent out that it keeps on hand in vaults or deposits at the Federal Reserve. Let's look at a simplified version of a bank's balance sheet because I think that will help us tremendously. A bank's balance sheet or T account is organized into two parts, assets and liabilities. Assets refer to things the bank owns that are or can be converted to cash, while liabilities represent money the bank has promised to pay to somebody else. A bank deposit goes on the liability side of the balance sheet because a customer can walk into a bank at any point and demand that the bank gives them the money that's in their account. So let's say that a person deposits $1,000 in the bank. That deposit is a liability for the bank. The reason we call this a balance sheet, by the way, is because assets equal liabilities. So we need to make sure that our sheet is always balanced. This $1,000 also represents an asset for the bank because it is now holding $1,000 in reserve. So this $1,000 is simultaneously both an asset and a liability for the bank. Before we go any further, I want to remind you of two things. Banks make money by making loans, and our fractional reserve banking system requires that banks keep a fraction of their deposits as reserves. In the U.S., the Federal Reserve, aka the Fed, sets the required reserve ratio, the percentage of deposits that the bank must keep on reserve and isn't allowed to lend out. This means that we can divide a bank's reserves into required reserves and excess reserves, and both terms mean exactly what it sounds like they should mean. Required reserves are the reserves a bank must keep on reserve and can't lend out. And excess reserves are any reserves above and beyond the required reserves that banks can lend out. And we're going to typically assume that banks want to lend out all excess reserves since they make money by making loans. So it makes sense that they'd want to make as many loans as they can. And until 2008, this is a very strong assumption. Notice the data on excess reserves basically zero until then. And then all of a sudden, excess reserves skyrocket. The reason for that dramatic shift is beyond the scope of this lesson, but I promise we're going to learn about it in 4.6. Let's say that the reserve requirement is 10%. The bank must keep 10% of deposits on reserve and can lend out the other 90%. So we can rewrite our assets column and say that required reserves equal $100 and excess reserves equal $900. Quick double check and yep, our assets still equal our liabilities. Do you notice a potential problem here though? Because the bank lent out 90% of its deposits, it is susceptible to a bank run. Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over there at the bank, George. That's got all the earmarks of being a run. A bank run is when many depositors demand their deposits at the same time. If that were to happen, the bank wouldn't be able to pay back all of its depositors at once. Bank runs used to be much more frequent, in fact, about 9,000 banks failed in the early years of the Great Depression. Even if a bank is solvent, if enough people panic and demand their deposits from the bank at the same time, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, where people worry that the bank won't be able to pay all the depositors, so they rush to the bank to withdraw their money, which makes the problem worse until the bank actually does run out of money. 
Bank runs today are much less common in part due to the establishment of deposit insurance and the role of the Federal Reserve as a lender of last resort. Deposit insurance has been useful in preventing bank runs, but has had some unintended consequences. And we'll talk more about the Federal Reserve very, very soon. My next sentence is very important. Excess reserves are the basis for an expansion of the money supply by the banking system. Now in English, when banks make loans, they create new money. Okay, so let me show you how banks electronically create money out of thin air. Let's start back at the beginning. Assume that the reserve requirement is 10%. Jack deposits $1,000 at Island Bank. Island Bank keeps $100 and has $900 in excess reserves. The bank is gonna lend out all excess reserves, but what happens next is super important. We assume that all dollars lent out are deposited back into the banking system. It doesn't have to be at the same bank, it can be at any bank, but we assume that the person who takes the loan out spends that money and it all finds its way back into the banking system. So the bank lends $900 to everybody's favorite outlaw, Kate. Next, Kate deposits $900 at Smoke Monster Bank. The bank keeps $90 and lends $810 to everybody's favorite bad boy, Sawyer. Total deposits in our banking system are up to $1,900 and total loans are up to $1,710. Next, Sawyer deposits $810 at Flashback Bank. The bank keeps $81 and lends $729 to Locke. Total deposits, $2,710 and total loans are up to $2,439. This process would continue until we got to fractions of cents and there was nothing left to lend. But we'll stop there because I think we get the point. Remember, the money that Kate, Sawyer, and Locke have would not exist without Jack's deposit. By lending their excess reserves, the bank has in a very real way created money. This has very important implications for us. One is that a dollar deposited into a bank will lead to a total increase in the money supply by an amount greater than one dollar. Thankfully, there's an easier way to calculate the maximum total change in the money supply, and that's to use something known as the money multiplier. Make sure not to confuse this with the expenditures multiplier back from unit three, but the money multiplier is one divided by the reserve requirement. We could also say that it's the reciprocal of the reserve requirement. To find the money supply after all the loans and deposits have taken place, we use the money multiplier. If the reserve requirement is 10%, like we've been using, 1 divided by 1 tenth equals 10, so our money multiplier is 10. Our initial deposit was $1,000, so multiply that by 10, and the money supply now equals $10,000. Here's the thing, this multiplier can be used in a lot of different ways on test questions, so be very careful using it. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. A question could also ask you about the maximum change in bank reserves as a result, so we just take 10% of that $10,000 number and get $1,000 is the total amount of required reserves. Along the same lines, you could be asked about the total change in the monetary base. So it's important to remember these definitions. The monetary base includes currency and bank reserves. Now, since one of our main assumptions underpinning all of this entire lesson is that all money gets redeposited into banks, that means that we're assuming currency is zero. So the question is really just asking what happens to bank reserves, which we just answered. And this highlights another sentence that should be in your notes. The money multiplier is the ratio of the money supply to the monetary base. So the monetary base times the multiplier will always equal the money supply, as it does in this case. You could also be asked about the maximum dollar amount of loans made in the banking system. There are a few ways to do this, but they'll each get you to the same place. Since the dollar amount of loans is equal to the excess reserves, we can just take 90% of the total amount of deposits, $10,000, and we get $9,000. We could also just take the total deposits and subtract the initial deposit since everything that was created is the direct result of loans. So 10,000 minus 1,000 equals $9,000. Or instead of asking you what the size of the money supply is after the multiplier, a test question could ask you for the dollar amount of the change of the money supply. This can be a little bit tricky because there's two different ways to solve this depending on the specifics of the scenario. The key thing is to look at the initial action and decide whether that money was already part of the money supply or not. Now this scenario began with Jack depositing $1,000. So that $1,000 was already part of the money supply. 
Remember, the money supply has two parts, currency and demand deposits. So before Jack deposited $1,000, it was currency. So it was already part of the money supply. So the total increase in the money supply is only $9,000. We have to take the total, $10,000, and subtract the initial deposit. Sometimes we can just use the multiplier and don't have to subtract anything. That'll be the case if the initial deposit wasn't already part of the money supply. Unfortunately, I can't get too specific because we haven't learned about monetary policy yet. That's coming up next. But if this whole chain reaction had started by an action of the Federal Reserve, we would not need to subtract since that money wasn't part of the money supply before. And here's what that could look like. The Fed makes an open market purchase of $1 billion and therefore bank reserves increase by that amount. The money supply will increase by 10 times that or $10 billion. In reality, the total change in the money supply is smaller than what we're calculating, mainly because banks may hold excess reserves, which is especially true today. Additionally, not all dollars will be deposited back to the banking system, since some people will want to hold some cash. All right, I know I threw a lot at you, so stick with it. Practice, you got this. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Check out the description for a link to get the answers to these practice questions, as well as the unit notes and a great review book, Macro in 250 Words, written by yours truly. And I will see you in the next video.